This morning we begin a new series in the Gospel of Luke. So if you would please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke is found in the New Testament. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And this morning we'll cover verses 1 through 4. As you're turning there, Chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. Usually when we begin a book, we'll begin at the beginning. But you never know, Henry. You never know. I just, I just, yeah, the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. There are, many, there are many ways we can summarize the message of the Gospel of Luke. There are many different phrases we can use. But I have chosen to use the phrase, in his steps. Because I, I'm feeling led by the Lord that our focus this year is to learn to walk and to breathe and to talk and to think and to live like <laughs> Jesus. And in the Gospel of Luke, that's exactly what we see. It's Luke inviting us to walk alongside of Jesus so that we might learn to live like Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And once we finish the Gospel of Luke, we're going to go to his second book, which is the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And in that book, we're going to not just learn how to live like Jesus, but learn how to live for Jesus. So the Gospel of Luke will be in his steps, and the book of Acts will be in his name. Because we're called to be his witnesses. So read with me, if you would, chapter 1, verse 1 and 4, and then we will pray. 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So please pray with me. Lord, we give you thanks that you have not left us in darkness, that you have given us your word, the living word in Jesus and the written word in the Bible, to give us certainty about the things we have heard and been taught, that we might learn to live like Jesus and thus live for Jesus, to walk in his steps, and to walk in his name. We pray that as we go through the Gospel of Luke in the coming months, and then the book of Acts, that you would open our eyes, that you would open our ears to be attentive, to hear, to see, open our hearts to trust, and our minds to understand, and our hands and feet to go in obedience, trusting that where we go, you go with us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for those of you that don't know, the Gospel of Luke was written by Luke. Now as you see here in verse 2, Luke was not himself a, not an eyewitness. Read with me again. Look at verse 1 and 2. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative. So other people have undertaken the task, have endeavored to compile a narrative, a story about the things that have taken place the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. He says other people have tried to do this. And we believe that by the time Luke wrote his gospel, the gospel of Matthew was already written. Right? So we believe that the gospel of Matthew was the first gospel written while the church, for the most part, was still in Jerusalem. You have to remember, and we'll learn more about this when we go through the book of Acts, that for the first 10 to 15 years of the church, the church was for the most part concentrated around Jerusalem and mostly Jewish believers. It wasn't until Peter gets called by God to go see Cornelius and Paul, who used to be called Saul, gets converted, that then the gospel goes to the Gentiles and non-Jewish people begin to believe. And that's around 15 
to 20 years after Jesus was dead and raised. And so during those first 10 to 15 years, the Gospel of Matthew, if we're told by the early leaders of the church, that Matthew wrote down the Gospel of Matthew. And that's what was used to tell the story of Jesus. But as Paul and the other apostles go into lands of non-Jewish people, non-Hebrew speakers, non-Aramaic speakers, people who aren't raised in the Jewish traditions, the Gospel of Matthew was still being used, but they felt the need to have it a little bit more contextualized for non-Jewish people, for Gentiles. And the tradition is that Luke, who was a companion of Paul, took on the task of compiling the sources that he had, both the Gospel of Matthew and personal conversations and interviews with people that had been there and eyewitnesses that we have here, and put together this masterpiece that we call the Gospel of Luke. And along with that, the Book of Acts. And Luke, for those of you that don't know, uh, was a physician by trade. A physician that for some reason, we don't know his story, decided to travel with Paul in his missionary journeys. Decided to leave everything behind for some reason. Decided to leave his trade and use the talents and skills that he had acquired in his training to not bring just physical healing, but to bring spiritual healing to people. And as we go through the Gospel of Luke, you'll see his attentiveness to detail and his uh, just ability to describe things in a way that really baffles most of us. But it's really interesting that one, Luke was not himself an eyewitness, and two, was not himself an apostle, but yet devoted his time his energy to leave this for us. And in fact, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts put together make up 27% of the New Testament. So here you have somebody who, as far as we're concerned, is a nobody, is used by God to write 27% of the New Testament. And that's if you don't consider the fact that he likely also wrote the letter to the Hebrews, that Paul spoke it, but Luke wrote it. And if you put together the letter from Hebrews and potentially his letters to Timothy and Titus, then Luke is responsible for writing almost 50% of the New Testament. And then, I don't know about you, but that's pretty baffling. That's pretty mind-boggling that God is willing to use ordinary people in their different stages of life, in their different trainings, to advance his mission. And the goal that I want us to get out of this is that he wants to do the same with you and through you. All right, so the question is, why then study this now? Right? Why not something else? For the last few months, the Lord has laid out on my heart that more now than ever, we need more people living like Jesus. We need more people living for Jesus. So many people are living for themselves. So many people are living like the world. We need more people living like Jesus. We need more people living for Jesus. And I could think of no better text, no better book in the Bible than, to, than the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts to take us into the presence of Jesus and walk alongside of him and learn from him. And so, what are a few things we can gather from these first four verses? The first thing is we want to ask the question, why did Luke write this book? Notice in verse 3. It seemed good to me, since all these things were happening, having followed all things closely for some time, to write an orderly account. In other words, Luke is wanting to put together a story that's well put together for a purpose, an orderly account for purpose. And notice how he says this to a man, most excellent Theophilus. Now, we don't know who Theophilus is. We know that both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were both written for this man, Theophilus. In the ancient times, it was common to have someone be the sponsor of literary works. It wasn't like you and me today. We can just go to the store and buy a book and just start writing or a, a, a notebook for 25 cents at Walmart or just open up our tablets or our phones or our laptop and just start typing away and then we can send it to the printer down the store or to Amazon and go print it for relatively cheap. In the ancient days, you had to either use papyrus, which was very expensive, and also, or if you wanted a, a copy that would last a bit longer, you used parchment, which was made out of 
animal skin, all right? And not to mention the ink and the time that it would take, the involvement. Most literary works had someone that was wealthy to sponsor <coughs> that task. And so it's very likely that Theophilus here is this person who has been willing to take of his riches, take of his treasures, to sponsor Luke in this mission. And so it's interesting that we see the different parts that God calls different people to play. You see, Luke left behind his practice of being a physician and was willing to use his skills and his uh, talents to put together this narrative for us. But he couldn't do it alone. He had to use the help of someone who wasn't able to do it himself but could support financially. And God is wanting to use both types of people, those who are willing to go and do the task, and those who would like to go but can't, but can send. They can support. And maybe that's some of you. And so this Theophilus sponsors Luke in his task, and Luke is able to write for us an orderly account. But notice the reason in verse 4. What's the reason? So that you may have what? Certainty. Certainty concerning the things you have been taught. It's very interesting that that phrase right there, the things you have been taught, is the Greek word that we get our word catechism from. Anybody familiar with catechism? What's catechism? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a formal type of instruction in which you're training somebody, you're teaching somebody the things of God so that they might become a, a disciple. Some of you have come from Roman Catholic traditions and other traditions like Anglican and Methodist, and they do a little bit more formal of this thing called catechisms, where they train out the young kids in a, typically in a question and answer based uh, format. But in the early church, the word catechism was used to refer to this process of training these, the believers, young and old alike. It's what you and I would call discipleship. This training up, teaching them the things of Jesus so that they might become a faithful disciple. And so here's Luke. He's writing this detailed story, this detailed narrative about Jesus for the purpose of having certainty concerning the things that he's been taught. So that you and I can grow up in our training. You and I can become faithful disciples. And that's going to be one of the major points of not just today, but the rest of the year. That Jesus calls us to be disciples, not a fan club. And I hope you guys understand the distinction there. In our modern culture, it's very easy for us to become fans, fanboys, fangirls of many different things. If you go back to the 90s, remember all those boy bands, all those girl bands, and all their fan clubs? Go back to the 50s, you got the same thing. And yet, for some reason, the same mentality has creeped into the church. That we think to be a faithful disciple means simply that you're just somebody who likes Jesus. You just think he's cool. Or you just know certain things about him. And oftentimes we'll think that a faithful disciple is just a churchgoer. Right? I, I, I go to church every Sunday and Wednesdays and so on. And, and really, although that's good and helpful, we can, if we're not careful, run into the danger of really just becoming a fan club. A group of people who just know the right things to say and we get excited but then we go home and nothing really changes, right? Like people who are sports fans, they get all super excited and they go back to their normal job and it doesn't really change the way they live. But Jesus is not calling us to be a fan club, he's calling us to be disciples. To be people who have a certainty about the things they've been taught and having this certainty live a certain way. And that certain way of a disciple is a way in which we learn from the Master. It's a willingness to listen to the Master. It's a desire to love the Master and an ability to live like the Master. That's what a disciple is. 
Someone who learns from the Master. Someone who listens to the Master. Someone who loves the Master. Someone who eventually begins, uh, begins to live like the Master. And then, when the Master is gone, he, the Master says, your turn. Now you live for me. And get my message across. That's a disciple. And that's why Luke wrote this Gospel. So that people like you and like Theophilus and like me, who have been taught certain things, who have been trained some things, we might grow and continually grow. Because Jesus is not after fans. He's not after just people who have decent Bible knowledge and Bible truth. No, no he's not after just good old boys and good old girls who go to Sunday school and dress up nice on Sunday mornings. No, he's after more than that. He's after a family. He's after a close group of friends. He's after followers who live like him, which the Bible calls disciples. <coughs> this is very similar to the example we see here. From far away, we might fall for the trap of believing that these are real. Right? There's lots of people that know the right words. They do the right things. They're major fans of Jesus, and from far away, they look like the real deal. Like this flower here, these flowers, they look real. And I forgot that these were here, so I put a picture up there. But Jesus is not after artificial flowers, artificial trees. He wants the real thing. And that means we must draw near to him, we must walk with him, we must talk with him, we must get close to him to become like him. Because what false religion does is this. This is false religion. It makes you good, looking good, very good leaves you looking very good on the outside. But I can't change you on the inside. Jesus is calling us, calling you to be real disciples. He used the parable about this, remember? The difference between the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. And so if you see over here, the one on the left side is the real wheat before it actually uh, becomes ripe. But until it becomes ripe, it looks very similar to a weed that goes that grows close to it, which is called the Dardel. And Jesus spoke of a parable like this in Matthew chapter 13. He said that the kingdom of God is like this, right? That until harvest time, there are going to be people who look very similar on the outside. But when the harvest comes, then the difference will be known. And the question I pose to you is, are we going to be content with just being artificial flowers? Are we going to be content with just looking like the real thing? Or are we going to actually seek to be the real thing? But Jesus has given us everything we need to be the real thing. And that's the second point that I want us to, to focus on this year. It's not only that he calls us to be the real thing, but he has given us everything we need to be the real thing. That's why Luke wrote this down. Just think about it for a second. We're in the year 2024. Luke probably wrote this in the year 60 AD. That's almost 2,000 years ago, and yet we still have it. Most books from ancient times you don't have. And it was preserved with such a care that out of all the other ancient writings in the world, the New Testament is the one that's most attested to. So ancient writings, for example, the history of Julius Caesar, there's only a handful of manuscripts that are almost thousand years after they were originally written. Yet, the New Testament, we have manuscripts that were within a hundred years of when they were originally written. And not just that, we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of copies that say the same thing. Yet, they differ here and there. They might spell Matthew with two T's, or it might say the Lord Jesus, or it might say the Lord Jesus Christ, or it might say the Lord Christ Jesus. And these manuscripts are different, but they all point to the same Jesus. For 2,000 years, thousands of miles apart, to Youngsville, in the middle of nowhere, random group of people, and we have it written. Because Jesus has called us not to just be a fan club, but to be faithful disciples. And he's given us everything we need in his word and in his spirit. Now, if we stop here, we can, you know, pat ourselves on the back and say, man, I'm such a good disciple. So good. But Luke doesn't stop there. If you would, turn with me to the end of the book, because Henry, whenever we start a study, 
not only should we begin at the beginning, but we should always look at the end also. So you were almost there. You were close. Look at Luke chapter 24. It's always good to look at how does this book end? Where is the author going? What's the purpose of becoming a faithful disciple? Look at Luke chapter 24, verse 36. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. And he appears to his disciples. Luke 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, these are the disciples, they're gathered in the upper room, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. Shalom. But they were startled and frightened. And they thought that they saw a ghost or a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see there I am. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieving for joy and were marveling, he said to them, By the way, do you have anything to eat here? And they gave him a pinch of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be what? Proclaimed or preached in his name to, to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And if you would, now turn the page to, or a couple of pages, actually, because you've got to jump over the book of John. To the beginning of the gospel, of, to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 1. Book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus... Oh, boy. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Acts. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. And after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to his holy apostle, to his apostles, whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my, what? my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I'll stop there. Notice that the purpose of becoming a faithful disciple who lives like Jesus is not just to settle and say, look, I've received the light. I've received the Spirit. I have arrived. I've been blessed. I'm filled with joy. But the purpose is to take that blessing, that forgiveness, that light, that power from on high, that new life, and do what with it? Share it. Not to just live like Jesus, but to live for Jesus. 
Unfortunately, our culture has taught us not only that Christianity is about being a fan club, but really that Christianity is about just consumerism. That we just come to our gatherings just to get, get, get. I need to come and get my fix. I'm going to become a faithful disciple. I want to grow up in my maturity as a believer. Although that's good, that's to stop too soon. Because if all you do is get, 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 what's going to happen eventually? Your bubble's going to burst. You're going to pop. Just like the seed the Dead Sea. Some of you guys might be familiar with this. You have two major seas in the land of Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee in the north that gets plenty of water from the northern mountains and all the rivers that feed into it. And it's one of the most life-filled seas in that region. In fact, most of the stories in the Gospels happen around the Sea of Galilee. But then all that water from the, from the Sea of Galilee travels down the Jordan River and fills into the Dead Sea. I mean, there's Tons of water. This is a very filled sea. But guess what the difference is? The Dead Sea has no outlet. The water never leaves. It just settles. It just becomes a giant, stagnant pool. And eventually the water evaporates. And that's why it's so salty, and that's why there's no life in it. If all we do is consume, 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 and get, 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 we will be no different than the Dead Sea. And I venture to guess that this is the reason why so many people who call themselves believers are actually filling, living lives of depression, are living lives of despair, because they're not living the life Jesus has called them to live. They're filling themselves up, filling themselves up, and they never give. And like the Dead Sea, they too become dead. Because Jesus has called us not just to be disciples, but to be disciples who make disciples. To be disciple makers, not consumers. This is the challenge I have for us this year, and that the Lord has for us and for me, for you, that we would seek to grow as disciples of Jesus, but that we would use everything He gives us to make disciples of Jesus. To not just be content with being a fan club, and to not be content with just being consumers, but to be channels of His grace. You, I heard this from Matt last week, you might be the only Bible that a person gets to read this week. You might be the only theologian that that person might hear this week. You might be the only light that that person might see this week. How selfish of us to take that light and to put it under a basket. How selfish of us to take that salt and put it in the cupboard and pretend that that person doesn't need it. And then we complain about the problems of this world. Then we complain about the corrupt politicians. Mm -hmm. Then we complain about the terrible schools. And then we complain about our terrible neighbors. But are we sprinkling salt on them? Are we shedding light on them? Are we praying for them? Are we praying for those people that are bothering us so much? Jesus has called us not just to just be faithful disciples, but to be disciple makers. And this is actually the story, not just of Luke, but the whole Bible. Think about when God created Adam and Eve. He says, let us make man in our image, in the image of God, let us make them, male and female, he made them. Right? The likeness of God. Our need to read this stop and say, wow, wonderful. I've been made in the image of God. This is great. But where's God going next? Take this image, be fruitful and multiply. And then he went to Abraham and said, Abraham, I will bless you and I will give you a name that's great among all the nations. And Abraham could have stopped and said, wonderful, I'm blessed. Yay, let's sing about it. Let's write a song. Let's make a poster. Let me post it on Facebook. I am blessed. And God says, because in you, all the nations will be blessed. <clears throat> this is the case of Adam and Eve. This is the case of Abraham. And this is the case with you. I mean, you've been blessed to be a blessing. You've been forgiven to proclaim forgiveness and to forgive. You have received light so that you might shine it. 
not to just hide it under the cupboard. And that means that you and I have to keep polishing our light. We have to keep our salt salty. We have to keep our likeness to Jesus nice and sharp. And that requires that we use the gifts that Jesus has given to us. And these are the things that I'm constantly going to be pointing out. I've been pointing out already, but I'm going to be pointing out more and more. That we would love the Word of God. How do we become like Jesus? How do we live a life that honors Him and shines His light to the world? We have to love His Word. We have to dwell in His Word. Why do you think Luke wrote it down? If the Bible, if the Word wasn't important, God wouldn't have preserved it till today. You and I have to grow in our knowledge of the Word, our love for the Word, to learn it, to memorize it, to teach it to others, to love it, and to live it. Apart from the Word of God, we cannot become like Jesus. We just can't. Why do you think the first task of a missionary is to translate the Bible? Because soon I won't be here. Neither will you, but the Word of God will. And so if we are to be faithful disciples, we must grow in our love for the Word of God. That's why I printed reading guides for you, for those of you that would like. You can read through the whole Bible in a year, or you can read through the whole New Testament year. It's in the back of there as you walk out. There's plenty of other plans. It's like, it's like a workout program. The best one is the one you're going to use. So use mine or use others. But read the Bible. Hide it in your heart you might grow in your likeness to Jesus and grow in your ability to speak into the lives of others. When you hear that friend talking about her husband, complaining about her children, complaining about his job, speak God's truth into that person's life. But you must know the truth before you can speak it. As I was traveling down this Friday, I had to go pick up the children in Jacksonville. Uh, they spent the week at my parents' house, so we met up in Jacksonville. And as I was driving down, I had to stop to refuel, and I stopped right next to the gas station. There was a McDonald's right over here, so I was pumping the gas. And I was going to go to McDonald's, get some coffee. And this homeless girl walked up to me and said, hey, can you give me a soft drink? I was like, oh, of course. Of course, these people. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of just giving things out to homeless people, by the way. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm going to McDonald's, and anyways, here, coffee. I'll get you something. So... So I, I go in there, and she's with me. And I was like, you want something to eat, too? You know, you want burger or fries or something? And, okay, so as I'm getting the food, I see that a friend of hers walks in. And mid, mid, uh, meanwhile, I was talking to her and just see, how'd you get here? Where's your family? Oh, I'm here all by myself, and this and that. And then all of a sudden, a friend of hers shows up. I'm like, huh, not by yourself, are you? you know, I can see what's happening here. You're trying to abuse me. Ah, my $8. You know? <laughs> But when I got the food and I realized I was being tricked, I said, here, and she reached out for the food. I said, no, no, here, come sit with me for a second before I give it to you. And I, as I sat there, it only took a few minutes, I, I looked her in the eye, Jeanette, or as her French call her, a little bit, and I got to tell her about Jesus. Not fancy, not glorious, but I got to tell her about the life that Jesus offers her. And I prayed with her, and I gave her the food, and I drove away. And that doesn't make me a hero. I'm only using that to say there are people everywhere. And God is bringing them to you. And we can choose to stay quiet and stay comfortable. Or we can use what we've been given, and we can sow the seed. And let God take care of it. Right? At least now, when I stand before God, I can say, Lord... Jeanette came to me, and I was annoyed by her, and she tried taking advantage of me. But I knew you were telling me to tell her about Jesus, so I did. And it's not our result to save people, but it's our result to show them the direction of the life. So I encourage you. There are people around you dying, physically and spiritually. There are two million children being trafficked around the world every year. There are thousands of people groups without a Bible translation. There are billions of people that don't believe in Jesus. And you and I have His Word in various translations, and we know it, and we just sit comfortably in a nice room with nice heat and AC and comfortable chairs. What are we going to do with what God has given to us? 
There are people in your high school, Nathan, and in your teams, children, and in your jobs, and in the places that you go that need the salt of Jesus, that need the light of Jesus, and Lord forbid that we put a cover on it because we're too embarrassed. If that's the case, I would have you question whether or not you believe in Jesus and repent and ask for forgiveness and ask for strength. People. Because if he's called us to be faithful disciples, he's called us to be disciple makers, and he's given us everything we need. He's given us his word. He's given us this mission to be a part of. You don't have to ask, Lord, uh, should I go? Should I speak to people? You don't have to. He's already said, do it. Now, yes, not everybody needs to go to the Amazon, but everybody has to participate in the mission. Everybody. Charles Spurgeon said this, there are disciples of Jesus, and then there's frauds. There's disciple makers, or there's hypocrites. Because if you're not a disciple who's making disciples, you're just, I don't know what you are. Now that doesn't mean you're bringing people by the dozens to know Jesus, but that we're living a life of devotion to actually participate in his mission. To not just settle. He's given us a family. He's given us one another. That we would love one another. That we would love the family of God. That we would prioritize our gathering together to worship the Lord, to equip one another. Remember what Paul said to the Hebrews? He says, don't neglect the gathering as other people do. Because they slip away. They're slipping away from the living God. But you, gather together, stir up one another to love and to good works. Love the Word of God, love the mission of God, love the family of God, and love the presence of God. He has given us everything we need. That's why uh, this today we started during our Sunday school hour. Francis is teaching a class, which I would encourage you to be part of. Jim teaches a class for the younger people. And then there's kind of a few just loose ends here and there with people that, some motley crew of people that hang around with me, we practice music. And then we decided the the today to take that time from 10 to 10.45 to pray. And that's what we're going to be doing every week. So I want to encourage you, you can come to one of the Sunday school classes or you can come and pray with us. And we're going to be praying for those 45 minutes. And that's what we did this morning. We were a little behind, so we prayed for 30 minutes. But I want to encourage you, pray in your house. Pray with us here. Seek the presence of God. Seek the Spirit of God. Because apart from Him, we can do nothing. But with Him, we can do all things. So, for those of you that I have perhaps stepped on your toes, I want to remind you it's for your good that Jesus steps on our toes. It's for our good that he bruises us. It's for our good that he calls us out, that he rebukes us. And he rebukes us because he wants what's best, and he wants to use you to be a faithful disciple and to be a disciple maker. So as we close, I just want to remind you of a few things. Single people, widows, those of you that are divorced and are single, a spouse will never give you what Jesus can give you. If he gives you a spouse, wonderful. If he doesn't, then that means he wants you to use your singleness for him. Children, fame and fortune will never give you what Jesus can give you. If he chooses to give you fame and fortune, wonderful. Use it for his name. But if you get none of that, you still have him in it. Being part of the popular crew or whatever it is, you know, what are they calling now? You're lit. And you got your drip. Even if you got no drip, if you got Jesus, you got everything. Married people, there is nothing more important for your marriage than for the two of you to seek Jesus together. And to use your marriage to make others know about Jesus, especially your children, if you have them, or grandchildren. There's nothing more important, parents, about your children than for them to be disciples of Jesus. They could become millionaires. If they don't have Jesus, they have nothing. So children, remember, your parents want you to be disciples of Jesus. Those of you who are workers and employers, he has given you a job for a reason. At a particular place. 
with particular people who have particular problems, and you are there to be a spokesman, an ambassador for the light. Whether it's at the dentist office, at the police station, at the mechanic, at the welding mobile, a welding clinic, or traveling, or even at the Taco Bell. He's placed you there for a reason. Be a faithful disciple who makes disciples, and by his grace, that is what we will do. Amen? Amen. So I encourage you, this Wednesday, we'll be back here in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, and then at 6.30, we're going to walk through a little bit more, uh, carefully through the different themes that we're going to encounter in the Gospel of Luke. So I encourage you to be there. We're going to walk through kind of the whole book of Luke, just looking at different themes. All right, so that's this Wednesday. And one last thing. There's lots of things that we will not be able to cover on a Sunday morning about the Gospel of Luke. My purpose is not to teach you the book. My purpose is to teach you how to learn and read the book for yourself. So if you're coming Sunday and then you're not reading it at home, it's better than nothing. But I really want to encourage you to read the Gospel of Luke at home. Utilize the tools and, and the insights that we'll get Sunday morning and Wednesday for yourself. And particularly your Wednesday, bring your questions. Bring your comments. I was supposed to bring a question box today, Caroline. I forgot. All right? But... Bring your questions, bring your comments, because this is a community event as we seek to bring disciples together. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that in Jesus we can find new life and bring this life to a world of darkness and death. Have mercy on us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.